Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to today's webcast, Applying a Social Justice Lens to Your International Grants. We're going to wait just a minute for everybody to get into our virtual session, and then we will get started. Welcome to those of you that are joining us. Thank you for being here with us today. We'll get started just a couple of minutes past the hour just to give everybody the opportunity to be online with us and, and up in the system. Thank you to those of us, those of you that are with us today. We're excited to get started in just a couple of minutes. All right, we have people coming into the session. We'll give everybody just another minute or so and then go ahead and get started with our presentation. Thank you for joining the session. Again, this is applying a social justice lens to your international grants. Glad to be presenting this topic with you today with our friends from CAF and we'll get started in just one minute. All right, welcome, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. This is Applying a Social Justice Lens to Your International Grants, one of our webcast series. Thank you for being here today. We are just a couple minutes past the hour. We're gonna go ahead and get started um, to respect everybody's time. Just a few housekeeping notes. Um, thank you for being with us today. We are engaged on Zoom. I think we are all very familiar with Zoom these days, but just in case, um, you have the ability to chat. You'll find that function at the bottom of your screen. If you would like to share something with the panelists, you can click all panelists. But if you'd like to share something with the other attendees as well, you can click all panelists and attendees that will send your note to everybody on the webcast today. If there are resources that you would like to share, if there's information that you'd like to share with the whole group, please feel free. We encourage you to go ahead and engage with the panelists and your other attendees. So feel free to click that box and share with the whole group if there's something that you have to add to the conversation. We will be taking questions at the end of the session today, but feel free to enter your question in the Q&A box at any time throughout the session. You'll find that Q&A box also at the bottom of your screen. You can go ahead and type your question there at any point in time during the session. And then at the end of the session, I'll be sharing the questions with our speakers today. You also have the opportunity to upvote questions. So if somebody put a question in the, the Q&A box that you also would like answered, just click that thumbs up button and that tells us that you're also interested in the answer. When we take the questions at the end, we'll take the ones at the top of the list with those upvotes. So if there are questions there that you'd really like us to answer, go ahead and click that thumb thumbs up button, and then we know that um, many of you on the line would like for us to answer that. We'll answer it first. So with that, I am excited to introduce our panelists today. Um, our friends from CAF are with us, and they're going to be sharing their screen as we get started. Um, again, this is applying a social justice lens to your international grants for those of you just hopping on the line. Um, today, we're going to hear from Jesse Kraft, who is the Senior Vice President of External Affairs for CAF America. Jesse's been with us before and also at our conference. Many of you know Jesse. We're glad to have her back. Presenting with her is Jill Bates, who's the CEO of CAF Southern Africa. So glad to have that international perspective with us today. And also on the panel is Paula Jansko Fabiani, who's the CEO of Aegis, um, the Institute for the Development of Social Investment. So we're thrilled that these ladies are with us today to share their expertise and ready to, to get started. So Jesse, with that, I will hand it off to you. Great, thank you so much, Erica. Um, so first, um, just to set a, set a little bit of context here, just to tell you a little bit about CAF America. We are a public charity in the United States. Uh, we work with all types of donors that want to give internationally, corporations primarily, but also foundations and individuals. Um, and we, our, our work is governed by what we call our three R's. And this is a guarantee on our work um, that focuses on regulatory compliance, risk management, and reputation protection in, in all of the grant making and charity um, partnerships that we that we undertake. Um, and I am joined by two of my colleagues from the Global Alliance, but while CAP America does grant in over 110 countries every year, 
we do have offices um, through our global alliance in specific countries and, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by two of those offices um, who will be speaking a little bit later. Um, but this is, this is our global presence in terms of the CAF Global Alliance itself. Okay, so jumping right in, um, because I know this, we have a short period and there's much to discuss in this topic. Um, so I, I want to start by setting the stage a little bit. So it, for, in terms of helping understand the reason why this is forefront for CAF America and also some of our donors right now. Um, Starting in March, we undertook a series of surveys for all, uh, surveying all of our charity partners around the world to help us understand the impacts of COVID-19 on their organizations and, and what their greatest needs were and what kind of support they were continuing to receive from their donors. Um, so four of these reports, four or five of these reports focus on our charity partners. Um, and then the fifth report focused on how this was affecting our corporate relationships. Um, and so if you haven't seen these reports already, there's really a wealth of data. We've we, uh, received um, responses from many organizations around the world, thousands of organizations um, in, over, um, in, in over 100 countries, well over 100 countries. Um, so these are all for free on our website. So please feel free to check that out. Um, but I want to specifically focus on some of the outcomes of the corporate survey. Um, so this, this was done in partnership with Cyber Grants and, and, a, and our partners at ACCP, um, we, we collaborated on this particular volume four survey to get an understanding of how COVID-19 was affecting corporate philanthropic strategy and sort of their outlook on their future trajectory um, for, for their philanthropy in the next few years. Um, and, and so this was, this was a really illuminating report that came out um, last month and it is also on our website and has a lot of information. But the specific information that brings us to this social justice topic is that within this corporate survey, you know, we were asking, of course, about COVID-19 and how it was affecting their strategy. And this is, this is one particular question that really highlighted for us how important social justice um, and, and racial justice grant making is becoming for our corporate partners. So um, within this question, we asked, um, do you foresee any permanent changes to your annual grant making strategy based on this experience? Um, and as you see here, we got, we received um, many responses on how, how their, how these, their strategy would be changing. Um, but one thing that we allowed in, in this question and others on the survey was narrative response from, from our corporate partners. And in many of those narrative responses, even though we didn't directly ask about it here, they brought up how important social justice grant making is becoming to their philanthropy and how they're starting to, to work on planning and building that into their long term strategy. So this is what you know we've of course always known that this is an important area CAF America has always funded human rights and social justice initiatives, but this really highlighted it as you know this is this is a topic that our corporate partners are you know are looking into and of course they've they've started asking us a lot of questions about it um, so we felt that this was relevant to bring bring to the table to help understand um, or to help guide on how you think about these topics globally um, so you know of course there are many reasons why this uh, this surge in social justice grant making might be happening you know of course the, the black lives matter movement comes to mind and plays a huge part in this um, but, you know, globally, right now, there are many other strains on human rights due to COVID-19 and other, other political um, factors that are, that are coming into play. But, you know, COVID-19 is really fueling some of the strategy shift as well. Um, just as an example, you know, the, the Office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights came out recently and said that, that government, government responses to COVID-19 are specifically including restrictions on public freedoms such as the freedom, the freedom of expression and, um, and, and the closure of, of certain civic spaces, which is really having an adverse effect on democracies and, and social justice movements generally. Um, so there are a lot of factors at play here uh, for why this is, this is becoming more topical for our corporate partners right now. So as I said, you know, we after the survey and, and in some of our just general strategy conversations that we have with our corporate partners, we've been getting some starting to get some really common questions. So first, I want to, you know, in talking about these questions to to tell you about what what our definition of social justice, what, you know, what we mean by this term. 
um, because there are many that that view this as you know funding specifically racial justice initiatives. But through this webinar, what, you know, one of the main messages we want to share is that this really changes country to country. The context is so different. So what, when we use the term social justice, we want to look at it more broadly in terms of various equality issues that are faced globally in different realms of society. So political, economic, social, um, and racial divides that might be occurring. Um, and, and social justice grant making focuses on those on structural changes and looking at the root causes of these issues um, to help uh, to you know, increase the opportunities of these underserved or discriminated communities. Um, so just to, to set that, that stage, I think is, is important um, to have that definition. Um, and so some of the questions we've been getting is how do we speak about our social justice strategy on a global level? Um, which of course is really challenging because for the reasons I just described, you know, it's so different in every area that you really need to think about, you know, if you're, if you're trying to speak about your broad uh, strategy, you need to keep it flexible and, and make it, make it seem, make it, you know, show that you understand that there are very different local contexts and that you're considering all those local contexts within, you know, the individual country strategies that you're taking. Um, Another question is, can you recommend organizations focused on social justice and inclusion in specific countries? And of course, you know, the answer to that is yes. You know, CAF America has a global database of, of organizations that we work with and we have worked with on these issues. And then, of course, we have local partners on the ground. And so we can help um, our, our donors identify organizations that, that would be most suited to, um, to assist with these, this type of strategy or to be partners on the ground. And then another question is, what issue area should I focus our strategy on within social justice grants? So, um, you know, there are, there are so many aspects of our society that are affected by these issues that you could really focus, focus your grant making in this area on some of the pillars that you might already be working in. So it doesn't need to be necessarily a completely new part of your grant making. Um, but, you know, you, we could, what you should also consider is how do you build in that with build this into the messaging of your of your grant making as well of the strategy that you already have um, so these are just some of the common questions that we're we're getting so there this is just meant to be a, a short roadmap of some of the really important considerations you need to take when you're starting to think about your strategy globally um, so this is a starting point um, to hone your strategy and, and a key factor you need to raise to a high priority level in each of these levels is how do you build this strategy in a way where you're positioning your grantees as, as partners and, and not just implementing partners for your strategy, but more importantly, as advisors that are guiding and building your approach in a given region. So, you know, if you focus them on them as an implementing partner, then you're not really listening and, and taking on that localized knowledge that these that these organizations have um, and your approach won't be as relevant or flexible. Um, so that's that's kind of a key piece that you need to think of throughout this planning. Um, so one of your important considerations is timing. So while it might definitely be the right time in the US to focus on these issues, it might not be the right timing elsewhere. So for example, um, you know, in some countries, the need um, the needs from the impact of COVID nineteen are so great that an initiative like this might fall on deaf ears or might not be picked up as readily. However, on the flip side of that, you know, as I've mentioned, COVID nineteen is is increasing some of these social justice and, and racial divides um, or political and economic divides that that we already have in some of these countries. So it might be the right time. So Again, understanding the timing is, is or, or building a, an approach in the right timing is you really need to work with those local partners to understand the context. Um, what topical areas? We've already touched on this a bit. So, so this, is, this is key because um, you know, there's so many pieces that you could focus on that, that you, know, you should hone it a little bit in order to have um, more impact. Building local knowledge. Um, so, you know, as corporations, you have so many local resources in your employee base, right? So I think that's, that's something we always advocate for um, in terms of building that strategy and understanding the importance of, 
of what those local employees could bring to, to the table in terms of that localized knowledge or understanding of some of those some of the issues and and the the, the interplay of those issues on the ground so really think about how you can build in um, your local employees into the strategy making and decision making around around this field um, are you open to long-term partnerships in this strategy so uh, specifically in, in the COVID-19 survey that I had referenced, um, it sounded like corporate partners were really focusing on this as a long-term strategy. So in turn, if you can look at long-term partnerships, that can be ideal in many ways because of course, structural change takes time. And so if, you, you, if you're thinking about it um, in terms of that longer term approach and building those partnerships for the long haul, um, you could you could have a lot more impact and then and then get to really better understand some of those local issues with those advisors that you have on the ground through those charity partners. Um, building flexibility into your strategy. So again, you really need to build space in your strategy to listen and be flexible based on the local context um, and the needs of your partners on the front lines. I mean, clearly we've seen some of the, the massive change that can happen with with global um, with the global pandemic that we're facing. Um, you know, a lot of these social justice movements have changed significantly during these periods. And so, you know, the the social movements and the the philanthropy around that and the and the strategy needs to change to follow that as well. So you really need to build some flexibility into that strategy to be responsive to those the local changes and local needs. And what are the local sensitivities? So this is a really tough one. Um, you know, how, how do those local governments feel about foreign donors that are supporting social justice initiatives in their country? Um, some of them welcome it, but um, unfortunately an increasing number of governments um, are not, not very welcoming of that approach. So, um, and so I'll just talk about that a little bit more on this next slide um, before I turn it over to my colleagues. Um, so just a few things that you need to consider outside of that roadmap um, in terms of, of social justice grant making generally is there are of course um, what we call inflow and outflow restrictions for how you can make grants into other countries. Um, and, and some of these inflow restrictions, inflow meaning how to get money into that local country, um, some of them are really important considerations for what type of social justice work you're doing in that country. Um, for example, you know, some countries require prior approval before grants can go into that country, either on an organizational level or a project level, in the case of China, for example. Um, and then some of these countries have local limits on certain activities, either across the board or specifically related to foreign funders giving to those causes. And unfortunately, human rights tends to be a major, um, a major topic when, when they are imposing those limitations. Um, it tends to be limitations on human rights and social justice issues specifically. Um, so that's another local dynamic that you really need to be aware of um, as you're going into uh, working into a certain country um, because you, you, you might be working in a very sensitive field and you need to be conscious of you know, protecting your, your grantee partners um, and, and then build your strategy around that too. And then even if there are no legal restrictions, there, there can be social stigmas around it. And then of course, we have our good old US outflow restrictions where you have to look at equivalency determination and expenditure responsibility requirements. Um, and then also um, in the US, there are limits on funding advocacy work um, in a foreign sense, but also generally. So those are some things, you know, if you have more questions about that, I'm happy to help um, help, help answer some of those um, if you get in touch later. So, but for now, I would love to turn it over to my colleague, um, Jill Bates. Um, Jill, if you want to turn on your camera and, and take over here, Jill is going to present, um, to present as a case study what some of the social justice issues that are happening in Southern Africa and South Africa. Um, and and she's, she's, she works with CAF Southern Africa. So Jill, I'll, I'll turn it over to you um, to, to present this case. Thank you so much, Jesse, and uh, a very good day to you, colleagues, and uh, everybody in the audience. And thank you so much for your your very kind invitation. Uh, it's an exceptional privilege for me to be joining you uh, in this very critical conversation 
um, and for me to share some perspectives and some reflections with you from South Africa, which I hope will add a small amount of value uh, today as we continue with our collective efforts to make this world a better place, uh, especially for those most vulnerable and marginalized members of our society. Um, so colleagues, today I'm going to uh, put the case for an enhanced social justice focus in philanthropy. And thank you, Jesse, for driving the slides for me, much appreciated. Colleagues, just a couple of comments on the South African landscape. Um, as you all know, South Africa transitioned uh, from an apartheid state into a constitutional democracy in 1994. Um, However, the institutionalized violation of human rights over decades has resulted in an inheritance of poverty, inequality, and unemployment, which sadly continues to endure some 26 years into our democracy. Colleagues, the COVID-19 pandemic likewise has existed, the, the existing fault lines, I think that Jesse mentioned, um, of poverty, inequality, and particularly those of the poorest of the poor have felt the ripple effects of this pandemic more profoundly. Um, Jesse, just to move on to some fast facts about South Africa. Uh, we currently have a population of 59 million people, women slightly outnumber men. We are a young population. Our average age in South Africa is 27 years old. Average life expectancy uh, is now 63. <clears throat> we have various ethnic groups in South Africa, as you all know. Our black South Africans uh, make up 80.2% 80 of our population. Our colored, colored colleagues and South Africans make up 8.8%. White South Africans are 8.4% of the population. And our Indian and Asian South African counterparts are make up 2.5%. Uh, colleagues, interestingly, yesterday we announced our unemployment stats uh, issued by Stats South Africa. Uh, they named the unemployment rate as 23.3%, but there was an immediate outcry um, from political analysts and economists who uh, noted that, that that particular figure was conservative. We are probably more looking at a figure of unemployment at about 42%. And analysts are even projecting that uh, this could rise to 50% as the effects of the pandemic um, take hold in our country. Uh, the youth unemployment problem is particularly concerning in South Africa. As I mentioned, you know, we have a number of, of young people, and by young people, I mean 15 to 34. Um, and that group make up one third of our total population. And of that group, colleagues, 63.3% are unemployed. Now we are especially worried about this group, uh, popularly known um, in the media as the NEAT group, which stands for Not in Employment, Education or Training. Now this group, we also are known as a group of young people who are becoming increasingly distressed, despondent, disaffected, and some media have even named this group as a ticking time bomb. So that is a, a group of South Africans that we are particularly concerned about. Interestingly though, colleagues, and quite ironically, South Africa is regarded as a middle income country. Uh, we are one of the strongest economies on the African continent. Uh, the strongest economy is Nigeria, who comes in at first, second is South Africa, and third is Egypt. I can also share with you colleagues that the South African labor market is heavily racialized and it is equally gender biased. Uh, our stats are also conservatively telling us that about 40% of South Africans live below the poverty line. And of course, a, a very small amount of very, very wealthy people have vast control over the, the wealth in South Africa. Next slide, please, Jesse. Colleagues, I thought it would be relevant for us to reflect on philanthropy during pre and post uh, democracy days. So during the apartheid era, there was a very, very strong and vibrant civil society together with international agencies and friends and colleagues like yourselves in the US and movements who advocated strongly and successfully for the removal of the unjust apartheid system in South Africa. 
And I think we, we are eternally grateful to our friends in the US for the role that you played uh, in helping us change this unjust system. So during this period, international aid funding flowed freely and generously into South Africa. Uh, the, the funding went into the mass democratic movement and into the very, very vibrant nonprofit civil society sector in South Africa, who fought tirelessly for democracy, equality and justice in South Africa. And upon the advent of democracy, uh, international aid was then redirected bilaterally from government to government. And this was to have a most profound effect on the South African nonprofit and civil society sector, which endures today. One of the th things that government immediately introduced was uh, broad-based Black Economic Empowerment, or BEE as it's commonly known. And this was, was introduced as a mechanism to redress the economic and the social injustices of the past, where Black people were systematically and deliberately excluded from the economy. Thanks, Jesse. Next slide, please. And so looking at uh, the challenges and opportunity for local and, and international philanthropists, in preparing for our discussion this evening, I, I talked with colleagues who work in the social justice space. Uh, and the, the, the opinion is, is, is quite clear that um, initially and during the apartheid years, international philanthropy was, was very easy. It was quite easy to get money into the country and money flowed freely. But my colleague, for example, who heads up the Social Justice Initiative in South Africa, um, noted that this initiative was established to ignite and grow funding in the social justice space. However, in her experience, it is really, really much more difficult for local philanthropists to give. And when I asked her why this position should be so, uh, she explained that many South African philanthropists are actually clients and customers and do business, uh, obviously legitimately with government. And this means that they cannot avoid running into politics. So this seems to have added you know, a, a layer of complexity in respect of local philanthropy. Uh, additionally, I think to your point, Jesse, there was also a time in our country where government regarded both local and international the uh, philanthropists with a measure of suspicion, you know, fearing um, anti-government agendas, etc. Uh, next place, you could click, Jesse. But colleagues in our country in South Africa, now more than ever so than before, social justice and philanthropy must be closely aligned. The COVID-19 pandemic has placed into sharp focus the need to restore the human rights and dignity of those most marginalized in South African society. And there's overwhelming evidence, colleagues, that a strong and resilient civil society is one of the critical pillars for the sustainability of South Africa's young democracy. Colleagues, if I may, at this point, please allow me to pause and share with you just a couple of really compelling and powerful success stories of, of social justice advocacy in South Africa. I think the first one um, relates to the issue of, of hunger. Um, it's said in South Africa that in fact COVID-19 pandemic will kill less people than hunger will. And so consequently in uh, back in July 2020, um, a social justice advocacy group called Section 27 brought and won a legal challenge in the courts to compel the, the, the local Department of Basic Education to continue with the school's nutrition program, which was suspended during the COVID-19 lockdown. So in South Africa, the vast majority of our children are poverty stricken and the only single meal that they get is at school. And when schools were shut down, those that meals and those feedings stopped. So section 27 took the government to court and thankfully won and consequently 9 million children now receive a meal every single day, whether they are at school or not. The second example relates to a little boy by the name of Michael Komape, aged five, who drowned in a pit toilet at his school in Limpopo during the year 2014. 
The matter was heard in the Supreme Court of Appeal in 2019, and judgment was found in favor of the family, and that was delivered in 2019. And colleagues, aside from obviously damages being paid to the family, the courts demanded a structural order for a sanitation plan in our schools, which is now especially relevant as our schools are slowly reopening and our children are returning to school. The third example relates to the delivery of textbooks in our schools. And in May 2012, Section 27 again made an urgent application to the High Court in South Africa when the government failed to deliver textbooks to schools throughout Limpopo. The court ordered the Department of Basic Education to urgently deliver the textbooks to Limpopo schools. Unfortunately, Section 27 had to approach the court twice more to ensure compliance with the order. The court also confirmed the right to basic education as an unqualified socioeconomic right. And colleagues, the last example and probably the most shameful and tragic in our post-democracy history relates to the life Isidemeni tragedy, which many of you must have heard of. In October 2015, the Gauteng Department of Health informed the Life Isidemeni PTY Limited company that they were terminating the contract in respect of providing care to over 2,000 mental health care users requiring long-term and specialized psychiatric care. Patients were transferred to various ill-equipped nonprofit organizations, despite the warnings and pleas of nonprofit organizations and families and lobby groups um, in the country. The, the result, con colleagues, was a tragedy where 143 psychiatric patients died as a consequence. So colleagues, this is just to show you how powerful that civil society lobbying and advocacy uh, has been in our country. Um, civil society, as, as my slide is, is arguing, can highlight gaps in policy, legislative and implementation frameworks in order to effect impactful and sustainable change. And as we've, as we've shown tonight, successful lit litigation has enabled millions of South Africans to gain access to antiretroviral drugs, sanitation and clean water, education and textbooks, amongst others. Next slide, please, Jesse. So here I've just mentioned a, a few of our social justice actors in the country. Um, I won't dwell on this, the, the slides and the information um, are available for you, but it is an extremely vibrant um, section and sector. But colleagues, notwithstanding this, uh, in South Africa, we have an annual publication um, of corporate social development um, activities in, in the country. Um, it really tracks the CSR spend um, of corporates in the country. Um, and during 2019, um, of the 10.2 billion rand that was spent in social uh, uh, CSR, the CSR space, only 1% of this funding went to social justice initiatives. So I think the, the, it's abundantly clear that, that we need to be changing um, this ratio completely. Um, moving to my last slide, because I'm conscious of, of time and, and needing to give my colleague Paula um, space. Uh, I, we also have to note, colleagues, that pretty much like Brazil, South Africa has one of the highest Gini coefficients in the world, which means that we have the dubious distinction of being one of the most unequal societies on the world in the world, in spite of, of having a very strong corporate uh, social responsibility programs, high net worth individuals, etc. So it's absolutely abundantly clear that South Africa must commit to the longer term struggle for social justice and continue to advocate for the dignity of all South Africans. And colleagues, we in the, in the country and indeed internationally, all of us actors, whether we are government, corporate, social, the corporate sector, civil society or philanthropy, we must put social justice at the heart, not only of our COVID-19 pandemic efforts, but way beyond, as we navigate a world forever changed, where vulnerable people have become even more marginalized. The present crisis, colleagues, requires our very best thinking, skill sets and resources, as well as good governance, coupled with agility and deep commitment to effect lasting, impactful societal change. We need to work together to enhance the quality of human life, 
and to restore, protect and promote the human rights of those most vulnerable in all of our societies. Colleagues, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Jill. Um, I would like to invite Paula to speak um, about the situation in Brazil on behalf of Aegis. Uh, Paula? Thank you very much, Jesse, and thank you very much, Cafe America, for bringing us this opportunity. Thank you very much to the Association of Corporate Citizenship Professionals holding this uh, webinar. And uh, nice seeing you, Jill, my friend from CAF Southern Africa. So it's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, I'd like to welcome all the, the, the people who are attending this webinar. So uh, our numbers uh, are a little bit different from uh, what you presented about South Africa. Uh, a little bit better, if we can say that. But Brazil is a very unequal country. Please, uh, the next slide. Um, we, uh, as you can see in this picture, we have, this is a very common picture in Brazil, where you, you have a very wealthy, the richest 5% of the Brazilian population living next to the, the rest of the 95. So we have, uh, it's a very unequal uh, society. We have around 200 people in Brazil, 200 million people in Brazil, sorry. And uh, just mentioning a little bit about the pandemic, we are actually the second country in number of deaths, just behind the US. And uh, we are the third in number of uh, cases behind the US and India. And our unemployment rate is 13% and is rising due to the pandemic and uh, poverty stands at 22%. After Southern Africa, it seems like we're doing good shape, but it's not the reality. Actually, uh, when we talk about gender inequality, is it one, uh, this is, this, all these numbers came from an Oxfam report about inequalities in Brazil. As we can see, uh, when we talk about one to one and a half minimum wages, the majority, are women, but when we move towards uh, higher income, uh, this uh, numbers invert. So we have, when we talk about the, the over 10 minimum wages, we're talk, we're, we see that women are half of the number of men in such uh, wage uh, range. But when we look, next slide, when we look into, um, Racial inequality is a similar picture, as you can see. But when we move towards the higher income uh, people, we see that is one to four. So for four uh, whites, we have one black that has a salary over 10 minimum wages. So it, it's a very unequal uh, society. And if nothing is done, we can expect that wage equality will only be reached in to, 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 uh, 2089. So we need to do something to change this reality if we want uh, wage equality to be reached sooner. Um, also talking about racial inequality, and it's important to mention that as happened in the US with Black Lives Matter, in Brazil we also have in the last years a rising debate about the racial inequality. Um, Brazil was is perceived in many, many years, the discussion about racial equity uh, was not so strong because the perception was that we have such a social inequality that it was not a racial issue. But as we can see, it is a racial issue. When we talk about, uh, we, and we're gonna show that uh, in the next numbers. When, but the ratio inequality is very linked to education. As you can see in the slide, uh, twice as much of the white population has uh, many years of study. And that reflected in uh, the numbers of employment, especially when you talk about higher wages and higher position employment. Uh, but actually, 
is not only because of education level, it's much more than that. There is a racial discrimination when we, um, when we look into the numbers about employment. Next slide. When we, we look into income, for example, we see that 76% uh, among the 10% of the poorest are black. And as I, I mentioned, more than half of our population is black or dark skinned. So um, we have the majority of the poorest in, within the black and dark skinned community. And we have only 17.4% of uh, the black and dark skinned people are among the 1% of the richest. And this is where we're standing. So uh, we really think we should focus on equity and not equality, where everyone has the same level of, of, uh, of opportunities. We actually have to provide better opportunities for the ones that are more, more vulnerable. We have to increase programs and increase funding uh, to focus on racial equity, gender equity, and other human rights aspects, because the reality is really that the ones that receive the more, they have the better opportunities in life. And we're not gonna change this if we don't have uh, a different policies and different uh, positioning of corporations, because corporations can do uh, a lot in terms of changing the reality of causes and topics. Uh, it's important to mention that Brazil has recently in, uh, implemented a quota system in the public universities. Uh, we, we know that even though uh, in the US there is uh, enormous challenges around racial equity, many universities have uh, quotas uh, focusing on this topic uh, for many years. But in Brazil, this is something recent in terms of public policy. And private schools, most of them don't even that have that. So I have uh, three teenagers, and I can see that this debate started last year only in the school they, they go to, this private school they, they go to. It's a very recent movement to debate racial equity in Brazil. The next uh, slide. And then I wanted to share with you some example of organizations, actually, uh, I'd like to mention that Brazilian philanthropic institutions and corporations, they have focused on education programs in the past uh, 20 years. Uh, enormous amounts of, of funding was invested in um, educational programs, but they never focused on uh, racial uh, group or, or black and dark skinned groups or even uh, on gender. This debate started 10 to five years ago in the investments of, of companies and also philanthropic institutions in Brazil. It's a very recent movement. Most of the philanthropic capital would go to education. And but many of the education programs like Parceiros de Educação, Instituto Arthur Senna are now focusing on having different strategy to focus on racial equity to, to improve the quality of education for black or dark skinned people in Brazil. We also have programs for income generation like Sebrae. Sebrae is a private public institution uh, that focus on entrepreneurship, uh, income generation, capacity building programs uh, to improve the possibilities of the population, especially the vulnerable populations. And now with the pandemic, this became a big issue because unemployment rates are increasing in the country. And uh, it's also an example of, and, and most of the people that participate in the program are dark skinned or, or black. Um, Baoba is an important initiative. It was funded by the Kellogg Foundation in the first place, an American institution. And it's the only uh, racial equity fund that exists in Brazil. And they, uh, are a very, uh, they are a great vehicle for any corporation that wants to invest in racial equity in the country because they search for the best projects that address this issue. 
Gerando Falcões is a, a civil society organization that focuses on youth empowerment, and they have programs all over the country uh, trying to accelerate other civil society organizations that work with, um, with young people, which are most black or, or, or dark skin, but mostly focusing on vulnerable populations. Amigos do Bem focus on poverty relief and income generation. And we have the, the ELAS fund, which is a nice example of, of gender focus. It is a fund that supports initiatives that uh, can promote women empowerment. And my last slide is of, uh, next slide, is about examples of corporate activities in that regard. Uh, on ratio-oriented hiring, Magazine Luiza is one of the largest uh, retail uh, companies in Brazil, and they just launched a training program only for black or dark-skinned people. And Bayer has done a similar uh, hiring process recently. This, is, this happened all this year. It's very, very recent. Woman-focused giving has happening for many, many years. Avon had a very good program for focusing on women and breast cancer, and Natura has also some initiatives. And now they focus on combating violence against women. And uh, Consulado da Mulher is also one uh, activity from one company from Brazil that focuses on women empowerment. And last but not least important, entrepreneurship and income generation. Estimulo 2020 is an initiative that came after the pandemic to stimulate um, small companies, to provide credit to small companies, and many of them uh, are, are started by people on vulnerable communities. And Liberty uh, Mulheres Seguras is a, a, an initiative from Liberty, a company that also supports women that are uh, uh, starting a company uh, and, and, and our entrepreneurships. So, uh, as I may, as I shown, Brazil is in a very unique, uh, unequal country with many, many issues. But what I like to highlight is that uh, the ESG trend has come to Brazil very strongly. And this is a very uh, important, it has become a very important topic to CEOs and to CFOs and uh, 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 the top level management of companies. And but what we see is that most of the companies don't have uh, policies and also initiatives for the S, the social. And also, so this is an important opportunity for corporations. If we improve uh, the communication about the S of the ESG and bring these possibilities of, in, of social investments and also philanthropy, philanthropic activities for companies, I think we have a path to involve corporations in solve, solving these important human rights issues of our countries and our societies. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much for presenting. I think we have some time for questions, which is great. Um, go ahead and put your questions in the Q&A box. We have a few already um, that have come in while, while you were talking, but for those of you on the line, if you have additional questions, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box. Um, I wanted to start with the first one, which is sort of at the beginning. It's a good question. Um, do you have any strategies for getting senior leaders comfortable with addressing social justice issues globally? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, Paula, um, I know that you've been doing a bit of work um, with a few of few companies locally in Brazil on this, so you might have other insights. But yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the strategies might be to frame it as I was sort of talking about earlier, uh, to frame it in the context of some of the pillars that you already work in, to share how social justice issues are embedded within those pillars, and that it's not a complete deviation necessarily, you know, particularly if they're uncomfortable with it, 
you know, to show that it's not a complete deviation, but that you can fit it within um, those pillars because of course it affects, um, social injustices affect um, many parts of our, our lives and economies and poli uh, politics and things like that. So I would say that as a starting point is one um, key way that you could look into building that conversation. Great, thank you. Can, can I mention the, the project that uh, Jesse Mm -hmm. uh, so this, uh, thank you very much, Jesse. I was running out of time and it's, it's uh, I, I didn't mention that. And it's also in, uh, it's very in, in the initial uh, thinking. So, the, the, it, but it's a very promising initiative. What we are doing is trying to identify how we can measure the gaps of the Brazilian companies around racial equity and uh, transform this gap into a measure that indicates how much philanthropic initiatives or uh, social investment we need uh, for, to fill this gap. Also compromising the company with some measures to reduce the gap over the years so that we don't need to reach 2089 to, to, to get, get to wage equality and also bring more uh, black and dark skinned people to higher positioning in the in the, the Brazilian companies, so it's a very promising initiative because this could be made globally. Thank you, thank you. Um, the next question that we have: How are companies evaluating international partners to ensure they're not only the right fit but also accurately representing local needs? Yeah, that's a, a great and and difficult question, I would say. And again, you know, is is based on the local context. Um, but you know, I would say one of the ways that they're that they're approaching this question is is one by using their local employees as a resource, or by working with um, you know groups like well, Cap America. You know, we have a full a network of of local partners that we could reach out to and and start that conversation and help them identify locally some of those organizations that might be a good fit. So. I think that the answer there relies on some of that localization of, of your approach um, in terms of uh, deciding which are, which, which are the best partners and what you should be focusing on. So, um, you know, I think at first, you know, you first need to understand the local issues and sometimes you need a partner to do that. But then from there, you can, once you understand those issues, decide how you want to focus your approach. Um, and then you can start your selection process after you have those those understandings in place. Great. Um, Jesse, this is probably a question for you. Do you see the US and other countries loosening grant restrictions specifically around the intersection between social justice and COVID-19 relief because of the nature of the that being a global emergency? Yeah, um, unfortunately, no. We haven't seen any loosening of you know, the standard you know, expenditure responsibility and equivalency determination requirements, all of those still stand and, and are very much the same. There hasn't been any change on our end around that. But, you know, I would say fortunately, those, those tools are, are actually quite useful, to, you know, and even though they do sometimes seem like barriers, um, they are actually provide us with a lot of opportunity. Um, and, you know, I know that coming from, we have an office in Canada and it's much more difficult to get money out of Canada actually. Um, and so, you know, just, just knowing that we have those tools is, is, can be good. Um, and I, I think, you know, they're not loosening related to this. They haven't loosened restrictions around funding advocacy or, or political activity around these causes. Um, unfortunately that's still a sensitive area, but it's, you know, advocacy is a, a a broad term that can encompass a lot of things. So if you're focusing on educational activities and not specifically, you know, lobbying for a particular law or things like that, those are all allowable um, uh, as long as you're not pushing a specific uh, piece of legislation or something like that. So it's actually quite broad um, in terms of what we're able to, to do from the United States. Great, thank you. And then the last question that we have, so if anybody has another question, go ahead and pop it in. Um, and this is probably for Paula and Jill. Um, can you share some examples of programs that have been successful in addressing income inequality in South Africa or Brazil? 
Okay, well, I can, I'll, I'll jump in first. Um, certainly in, a, in the South African context, I think I mentioned briefly uh, black economic empowerment um, initiatives that have been introduced by the government. Um, aim specifically at trying to to address the the, the vast disparity you know in, in respect of income in respect of access to opportunity etc um, and our government has introduced what is called a, a be scorecard for our corporates um, and that's pretty much like a report card that you would get at the end of your school term and it measures each of our corporates on a, on a variety of pillars and these kind of pillars are um, changing ownership of, of companies which have been traditionally been you know held in white hands uh, growing um, black management um, we also look we measuring on employment equity uh, preferential procurement and enterprise development is a huge initiative in South Africa because obviously our economy just cannot sustain you know the <clears throat> formal job seekers that are seeking to enter the job uh, economy so enterprise development is a huge huge issue and really the principle is that um, corporates instead of procuring from large other corporates should actually uh, procure from small black companies um, and that's how we are, are, are helping young small black companies gain access um, into the economy and then of course there are socio-economic development programs um, that corporates are, are having to run um, to reduce the gaps. Uh, much like Brazil, we have uh, initiatives that are aimed at empowering our youth. Um, those have been very successful. Um, again, you know, just empowering and helping the youth to, to become entrepreneurs, you know, and give them the, those kind of skills to not only earn their own incomes, but, you know, gr give uh, jobs and opportunities uh, to others. Um, and I think we uh, as CAF are, are trying to help our clients not to see this as a grudge purchase, but that this is really an opportunity to impact powerfully um, on the economic development um, of our country. So, so for us, black economic empowerment is a, is a very powerful um, and impactful tool in South Africa. Thank you. Paula, do you have anything to add? Yes, uh, I mentioned a couple of uh, in my slides, but um, so for example, the Sabrai program, which focuses on capacity building for young entrepreneurs and also uh, uh, try to promote income generation activities in vulnerable areas. So it is an example, an important example. The other one is Stimulo 2020, which is a credit to uh, new entrepreneurs. So that's also very important because uh, now we have a low interest rate in Brazil, but uh, until two years ago, our interest rates were, not, were one of the highest in the world. So it was really hard to, to, to have credit to, to be an entrepreneur. And also some uh, projects that focus on uh, favela, uh, the slums people, are the Preta Hub, which is, it is a hub, uh, it's black hub uh, for uh, black entrepreneurs. And uh, so it's also a very interesting initiative. And also there's another one that's called Favela. And they also uh, help uh, young entrepreneurs to start their businesses in slums. Uh, and finally, one trend that is coming up in Brazil is the blended finance concept. And there are some blended finance initiatives that are being developed that focuses on creating cooperatives of uh, artisans and uh, uh, people in vulnerable communities to uh, help them create initiatives that can uh, generate income locally so they don't have to leave the, the, these areas uh, in search for for income in other uh, areas. So this is some examples that we have in uh, Brazil. Wonderful, thank you. Well, we are just about at time. I wanna thank Jesse and Jill and Paula for being with us today and for bringing your perspectives. Such an important conversation and really appreciate you sharing your expertise with the group here. 
for everybody on the line, you will be getting a follow-up email that has the materials and a link to the recording. Um, you can see the contact information for the panelists there. So if we can uh, point you in their direction, if you have any other questions or need additional information. So thank the three of you so much again, and CAF for being such a great partner with ACCP. We really appreciate it. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank Bye. you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.